<clears throat> hey, period one. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All righty, folks. Let me go ahead and share the PowerPoint and uh, we'll get started. Okay, so today we are going to continue with Foucault. Uh, and I'm actually going to show you kind of the, the next uh, several uh, topics that we're going to get into. So um, let's see. Uh, there is a discussion board today, and the discussion board today is actually based off of uh, a thought experiment that we're going to do in class today. So just uh, get ready for that. Um, let's see. Sorry, sorry. I think some less. I'm just changing the date. Uh, and here we go. Okay. All right, can everyone see? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Then let's get started. Today is the 6th of May, as you guys know, uh, less than, a, oh shoot, how many days of school left? Uh, 28th is the last day? Yeah. 22, wow, 22 days of school left, shoot. Okay, well, uh, today's homework is just to read up. So I asked you to read uh, pages 10 to 17, which was a little bit more than I usually assign, but that's just because it's an overview. But now I'm gonna assign less reading per day. So today it's only three pages, pages 17 to 20, and then to answer discussion board number two. Today's topic is something that Foucault calls docile bodies. Um, that sounds kind of weird. Um, yes, and I'm gonna explain what he means by that. Okay, so I wanna start with a super, super quick review of the discussion board from yesterday. And uh, thank you for your answers, by the way. I was, I was leafing through a few of them. By the way, if for whatever reason you like, you know, don't manage to complete the assignment on time like the day that it's assigned, um, I will accept it, obviously. <laughs> So salute. It, it should still be um, <laughs> it should still be open uh, if you need to answer um, previous discussion boards. Okay, so basically what I asked you um, on Monday was what which, which do you think is a more humane punishment, executions or timetable? Could someone like really quickly provide an answer? Uh, let's, let's let's start with a quick review. Um, Adam, um, I said that uh, they're both inhumane, but um, but like ultimately it really depends on the nature of the crime to determine what's more inhumane. Like, um, if somebody robbed a bank, it would probably be more humane to put them on a timetable than to kill them right there because they still have the possibility of living a full life. But if somebody murdered somebody and they're going to go to jail for the rest of their life, then it's probably better just to kill them right there. So you're saying it depends on the length of the timeline, of, of the timetable? Yes. Okay, that, that's a fair opinion. Uh, Serna, what do you think? Um, I would say that both are inhumane, but in different reasons. In the timetable, you're torturing someone psychologically because they have lost all of their freedom. But also with just killing a person, if that person truly values their own life rather than their standard of living, they would probably find the timetable more humane. But I agree with Adam that it should also be dependent of the crime because you can't have someone face the death penalty for tax evasion and for murder. Right. Okay. So, so it's, it's unreasonable to like, you know, kill somebody gruesomely um, for like tax evasion. But, 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 but hold on. I could just, I just argue devil's advocate here. So again, Foucault is not advocating for public executions, but he said in the past, the punishment more appropriately fit the crime. So if you stole, for instance, you might uh, get a fine. You might have to, you know, return goods, or maybe in some societies you got like your hand chopped off or something if you're a thief. Um, and so that, that's really brutal. But I guess I want to ask you, let's take it, this is really high stakes, like, you know, murder, prison and, you know, j jail for life. Um, let's, let's take it like way down. Okay, let's focus on just like a really common school example. Okay, you're late to, to, to class. You're late to class, the teacher's kind of a dick, and so the teacher does what? Sends you to get a late pass. Yeah, sends you to the dean's office to go get a late pass. And let's say it's like your third strike or whatever, so you, you, you get detention. Okay, would you prefer to go through detention, or would you prefer like in the old days when like the teacher would just, I don't know, hit you with a ruler or something and then send you to, the, to your desk? Like corporal punishment, like yeah, you're late, wham! Okay, go sit down. Which would you prefer? Or, the, or to go and waste your time in detention? Serna? Uh, to be honest, and I might be in a minority here, but I'd rather get, like, hit with a ruler. It might be because I have, like, a high pain tolerance and I already get hit with objects during practice, but, like, just also I find that line of waiting so psychologically torturing because you're just there and you have nothing to do and you're thinking I would have spent less time if they just accepted me when I was a minute late and 
be even more late by waiting in this stupid line. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, fair enough. But by the way, I don't think you're going to be in the minority in that opinion. But let's see. Uh, Jared. Um, for me, it would be, it's like, I, I would agree with Serna that I think getting like slapped on the hand would be more pleasurable in the moment. But like, I know that that would be a less of a deterrent than detention, I feel like. Because, really? because it, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I find like that, I mean, and some scientific evidence backs this up, the corporal punishment is a horrible method of disciplining people. If anything, it creates further abusers down the line and doesn't actually deter any like thing in the present. So I don't know, from like a macro perspective, I think that's dumb, but like in the moment, I would be too lazy to just go get a 30 pass. I'd be like, yeah, just get, get your nibbles in and let me sit down, you know? So, so, so personally, you would prefer just, all right, just get it over with. Yeah, but that's why it's not good if I personally prefer that. Interesting, interesting. Okay, uh, let's call on Ella and then Aaron. Um, I totally agree with Serna. I, yeah. I agree. I mean, I also think that like corporal punishment is stupid and is not a good way to discipline people. But like, I would rather just get like a quick hit with the ruler and then sit down than wait and do nothing in detention. Okay. Again, so it's, it's, it seems more torturous, right? It's spread out like your punishment spread out longer. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's fair. Uh, Aaron? Um, so I have mixed feelings. Personally, I'd rather just get hit, but it's also... Um, I've talked to my dad about this. Uh, he went to school when corporal punishment was still a thing. And what happened was the teachers would just do it whenever they could because they liked hitting the kids and they would do it more than necessary. So I don't know if actually getting corporal punishment would end up being like a couple quick slaps on the wrist. It would end up being go to the principal's office. He's going to paddle you for two minutes. Thanks. Yeah, maybe. Uh, okay. So it seems that a lot of you and actually, I, I, I think I agree, would rather just get hit once and then just get it over with rather than, you know, being sent to the dean's office or getting detention or whatnot. But I think, uh, Jared, you really hit the nail on the head there, which is, uh, okay, if, if, if kids would rather just get hit, then how come we don't give them that option anymore? Like, it is illegal for a teacher now to hit you. Like, if you came into my room late and I smacked you over the head with the ruler, I'd probably go to jail. But um, why? Like, what's the reasoning behind that? Because very few people are going to say what Jared said, which is like, oh, it's a more efficient way of instituting control. No, why are most people going to be against teachers hitting kids? You'd be totally okay if I just like, all right, put your, put your hands on the desk and like, wham, you'd be totally cool with that. Serna? I mean, Aaron mentioned this, but like, it'll come to the point where it'll be abused and also it would probably lead to more child abuse or domestic abuse at home because um, if an institution is allowing it, then why can't an individual family practice the same thing? Now, again, you're right. And you're thinking of, of again, macro effects, but I'm getting into a very basic fact, which is this. People don't like getting hit and we consider it a cruelty to hit people. We consider it barbaric. We consider it a, a backwards practice now. We, we, we think it's, it's, in a word, inhumane to beat someone. And so we believe that we'll get better results if we treat people more humanely. Now here's Foucault's genius. Foucault points out, we are not treating people more humanely by putting them on a timetable, by sending them to detention instead of beating them. We're not treating them more humanely, we're simply disciplining them more efficiently. Do you see the distinction? Because a timetable isn't humane either. Like, uh, it, it's, it's cruel to, you know, if you came to my class late and I hit you, we'd say, yeah, that's cruel. But sending you to the dean's office to go waste your time to then go get assigned detention, which will waste even more of your time, is also inhumane, says Foucault, just in a different way. And if you apply that to something like prison, you can see how that is much more, um, uh, you know, a, 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 in some ways a worse punishment than just getting beat and getting it done with. So they're both bad. Foucault's not saying, let's, let's go to one over the other, but he wants you to realize that they get disguised. Like, like sending someone to prison, sending someone to the detention, it seems more humane on the surface, but Foucault says it's simply disguised under something else. And to answer that second point, what's the purpose behind both these methods? Well, the purpose is just to control people. And it just so happens that timetables are far more efficient than public executions and beatings. That's what we're getting into today. So, uh, Aaron or Alejandra, somebody's like, 
I can hear a lot of static in the back. background. Sorry. No, you good. I think it's trucks. Huh? huh? There's there's trucks outside my house. Oh, trucks. Okay, I see. Okay, today we are going to talk about discipline. Okay, by the way, when Foucault uses the word discipline, I think he really uses it in a much more negative, pejorative way. I don't think that discipline is necessarily in and of itself bad. I mean, having some self-discipline is a good thing. I mean, that can, uh, you woke up today and went to class. And being able to have an exercise uh, regime, a, um, you know, a, 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 a just any kind of self-discipline is not necessarily a bad thing. It's when institutions start to discipline you without you even being aware of it when Foucault says it gets bad. So we are going to be going over disciplinary power and techniques of normalization. In other words, we're going to be going over uh, the techniques in which a society, and by extension, social institutions, discipline you. One, two, three, four. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to the last point um, uh, this, this, uh, this time, but uh, we're going to go over the first three points for the next three lessons. Docile bodies, the means of correct training, and then we're going to conclude with the panopticon or panopticism. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to get to the other, and, and a lot of what Foucault says is actually very similar to what Sartre said about the other. Uh, they, they actually knew each other. They, they were somewhat contemporaries. Uh, at the end of Sartre's career, uh, Foucault kind of came into, um, into popularity, and uh, it, it was kind of a passing of the torch of like, oh, the premier French intellectual to the next, so kind of interesting. Okay, so again, the next few uh, lessons, we're going to go over those first three topics. So today's docile bodies, next Monday will be the means of correct training, and then the, uh, the Wednesday after that will be the Panopticon. Clear? Good? That was a rhetorical question. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yes, and. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> yes, All right. Now, <clears throat> docile bodies is today's topic. So let's concentrate on that. Yeah, please tell me you heard that. Headphone users beware. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> That's like giving me PTSD. <laughs> okay, well, we have a thought experiment today, and of course it has to do with uh, young children. Does anyone have any really young siblings or, uh, or cousins? Yes, yeah, I'm really young. Me PTSD. Like, like toddlers. Yes. I have a cousin who's like four. Okay. Oh, perfect. Enough. Oh, okay. Good age. Okay. So this is uh, Dr. Wait. Phil. I don't know if that counts. What was that, Jared? I said I've been watching a lot of Dr. Phil on YouTube. I don't know if that counts. Uh, definitely does not. Uh, <laughs> okay. Anyway. All right. Here's a thought experiment. Oh my God. Okay. Right, and this might prove useful, especially for those of you that have younger siblings or, uh, or cousins or I guess watch Dr. Phil. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> Imagine that you are a parent. Let's assume that you, like most reasonable parents, obviously want your kid to behave and be good. One day, you take your child to the supermarket and they start to throw a terrible tantrum because you refuse to get them the cereal they wanted. They start screaming and throwing food items on the floor. The scene is getting so bad that people are starting to stare. What do you do and why? Answer thoroughly and think about the implications of discipline. Okay, so this is the discussion board question for today, but let's kind of, uh, tell you. okay, so I'll give you a second to read it on your own one more time and start thinking, what, what do you do? How do you discipline this child? Think about it, hold on, let, 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 it, let it stew for a second. I'm sure this was not, I'm sure this wasn't you when you were a kid. Hope. Okay, whenever you're ready, go ahead and raise your hand. Let's have a little discussion. So with Adam. Uh, so I've actually thought about this in the past because um, no, like, you know, just thinking about being a parent in the future. And in this situation, what I would do is um, I would just take the child out of the store and just go home. Just show that, uh, not like let them cry it out, not give them the item. Don't like let them win. Just take them out of the scene, then put them in a timeout at home. So just grab their little body, put them back on the shopping cart and leave. Yes. Okay. 
Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Serna? Okay, my mom used to always do this, so I think that I would do it. I would come up with a story of why they couldn't get what they wanted. Like, it completely made up, obviously. Like, I'll be like, oh, no, God said not today. Like, I talked to him this morning, and he was like, you can't have this cereal. And that's that's out of our hands, and I'm sorry. And then the child would chill out. I don't know. Like, it worked on me and my siblings. Damn, so you would lie to them. <laughs> yes, but temporarily. And then when I get home, I might deal with that. I'll be like, I lied to you that cereal's too expensive or you break, just can't have it they're gonna break any semblance of trust <laughs> well if i had to have parental issues they got a two it's a generational oh. thing oh yikes sir well okay you do you do such an interesting point which is yes oftentimes we will parent the way we were parented and that can be a very good thing or a very bad thing but it's okay as long as you're aware of it um mm-hmm. ethan what, what would you do Fucking buy the cereal, man. I'm not gonna. I don't care. Even I, I just no. buy it, and then they then talk about it later. I'm not gonna <laughs> have a whole big thing in the middle of some grocery store and embarrass myself and my poor innocent child. And I can just okay. deal with it in the privacy of my own home. Okay, Ethan. I, I know this isn't a class about chi- about parenting or, or child development, but please never ever do that. No, uh, no. I work. I when I worked at a summer camp for like I worked there for like three years, and this is literally a question we got asked during our interview. And my boss is like, "Yeah, you, what I would do is I would just buy it, and then you just talk about it when you leave the store, and the kids calm down, so you make sure it doesn't happen again. Oh. You just have a discussion about it like a reasonable adult." Okay, no, that that part makes sense, but but yeah, you just me, buy it in, in the moment. There's no point of trying to. If your kid's having a temper tantrum, that means they really want the cereal. There's nothing you can do. You either make your kid mad as hell and don't buy it. Or you just buy it and talk about it later and you make them understand that that's not how you get what you want. But if it's in the moment and they're a little kid, they probably don't understand that yet. Oh, yikes. Okay. And also, that's assuming you're a bad parent to even let that happen. Because you, if you are a good parent, then you should be able to avoid that situation from ever happening. Well, that's true enough. If, you, if you've been disciplining your child uh, already. But even, no, don't buy them the cereal. Because uh, that's going to encourage that kind of behavior. Uh, like, like then they're going to associate getting a tan, like throwing a tantrum with getting whatever they want. And then that's going to apply to behaviors later in life. Oh no, don't buy them cereal. Being reasonable and having a conversation with them is a good idea, but, oh, Alejandra? Um, I don't know. I, I always think about this because, um, I don't really want children, but my mom is always like you're gonna have kids one day and I'm like what would I do if this were to happen Mm -hmm. and I don't know um I feel like I would just ignore them but that's kind of awful because like you know they're not gonna they're not gonna stop having a tantrum until you acknowledge them and that kind of sucks but I know eventually they get tired out so like I guess it just depends on how much I'm willing to be embarrassed in public but yeah, I don't think I would ever um, buy the thing that they want. So you wouldn't buy, but you would just let them like kind of throw the tantrum? No, actually that's, I hate when people do that in public. I hate when parents do that. I don't know. I don't know what I do. Well, it's a good thought experiment. Even if you don't plan on ever having kids, uh, it's still a good thought exercise. Um, and you might one day be responsible for kids anyway. I mean, if, you have, if you're gonna, ever going to be an aunt or something. That's true. So better be prepared. Better think about it now. Um, yeah. Oh, and by the way, yeah. Uh, 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 Latino moms are the worst. Uh, they're always like that. My mom's like that all the time. When are you gonna have kids? Jesus, mom, calm down. <laughs> all right, uh, <laughs> Jared. Are you sorry, me or no? Oh, who's Hugo Slot? Ethan, you keep changing your name. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. Well, hold on, Jared first. Um. I would not, first of all, I would definitely not buy the, the cereal. That's like, a, that just gave me flashbacks to like Incredibles 2 when they keep giving Jack-Jack the cookies and he just like does not stop eating cookies. Um, but no, I would instead like, it, it's difficult because you don't want to impose on other people when you have a little kid. Like I hate being in a public space and just seeing a kid like melt to the floor. But in the same way, I don't feel as a parent you can feed into that at all. Like, in a way, you have to just let it go and not give them any sort of support or semblance. And then they'd be like, damn, that they don't, you know, they don't respect that behavior. Um, but I, you obviously have to find, as Ethan was saying, a medium between, like, oh, my God, not you, uh, between um, 
hurt like displacing other people and disciplining your own kid which is why i do agree somewhat that you would want to do this at home rather than like in the middle of a restaurant or supermarket Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So, uh, again, the uh, reason more reasonable. Um, Serena, and then back to Ethan. Okay. Yeah. Kind of responding to Ethan, you can't do that because, like, I have a little cousin who does that exact thing, and it gets on nerves every time. And like, the parent put it on me one time because he was like, "Oh, can you take her to go get ice cream from the ice cream truck?" And then he gave me five dollars. And this little girl wanted a whole Sunday with all the toppings. I was like, no, but you can't get that because that is, that is more than $5. And then she threw a tantrum in front of the ice cream man, and I couldn't do anything about it. So I bought her a different ice cream, and I was like, this is what you're going to get, and that's it. But um, also, I was thinking about it a little bit more because I don't want to lie to my kids that much. I was thinking about how many times this might occur. And also I was thinking about what Ethan said about how like this might not happen if you do it in the first place. So, which makes sense. I think that if you don't raise a child with material value, like if you don't teach them that um, materials or like things that you can possess have a greater value over an emotional connection or a relationship, then this won't result. And I think that this situation is a result of capitalism. Oh, you know, it's actually not too far off. Uh, I mean, definitely the way we parent our kids is rooted in, you know, economic factors. I don't disagree with that. Um, Maybe, maybe. Uh, 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 Oh, oh, back to Ethan and then Aaron. Oh, um, well, I don't really, I didn't realize my hand was still up, so I don't really have anything else to say. But, I mean, this is, it's kind of all laying on the tenant that, the, the kid is going to be greedy and not just be okay with not having what they want. So I, I don't know. I don't really have anything else to say. Okay. All right. Sorry. Well, yeah, I just saw your hand up, but okay. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, Aaron. Tell the kid they have to convince you to get them the cereal. Oh, convince me. That's good. Yeah. So, okay. What most parenting books talk about is, yeah, be trying to be much more reasonable with your, with your child but also trying to maintain discipline. Like the idea is you can't just let your kid do whatever they want or get whatever they want whenever they want it. You have to teach them that sometimes you don't always get what you want. And that if you do want something, you either have to, yes, argue for it or do something of, of like an, an equivalent exchange to, to get it. Um, equivalent exchange. Oh yeah, I guess it's a full metal alchemist reference. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you're welcome, Aaron. But okay. So, okay, now all good answers. I noticed though that not a single one of you, and maybe it's because you didn't want to admit it, but not a single one of you said that you would like physically discipline your child. Is that because you don't believe in it or because you just didn't want to admit it? Or in public. Right, but so maybe not in public, but like, you know, like, oh, when we get home, you're gonna get it, like type of deal. Uh, I wouldn't like to respond to that. Like, or, 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 or do you, are you guys just totally against like corporal punishment when it comes to raising kids? Uh, Let's call on uh, Ella. Yeah, I mean, even like with the class example, like I wouldn't enjoy, like I would, like corporal punishment is never ideal. And like what Jared said, it just leads to like messed up kids in the future. If you like constantly just hit your kids whenever they do something wrong, like that will lead to a fucked up kid or a fucked up adult because they just, they learn that like whenever they do something wrong, they're going to get hit for it. And like that, uh, recipe for disaster All right perhaps it, it, so it, it's so it's not a good idea for because you're, you're afraid of the kind of the future implications of, of of hitting a kid okay i guess that's fair uh jared um yeah i mean ella kind of hit on it as i was just, I was just gonna elaborate that yeah like physically disciplining your kids turns them into abusers and bullies at school it could it could lead to that um I, I, well hold on. I, i'm curious does anyone think like no it's okay like maybe every once in a while yeah you do have to like just like n- not abuse a child but like does does anyone want to ar- make the argument like yeah every once in a while you know sometimes kid just needs it uh let's call on Serna. <laughs> okay <laughs> this may be like entrenched uh or whatever like you know just stuff coming out but anyways it's just that like there are certain things where that I would find acceptable like one thing 
that in this situation, like, I think all Latino kids know is, like, the ear grab. And you're just, like, like, no one else can see it. It's just between you and your mom or also the la, ya vas a ver, you yeah. know? And so I feel like I would my I would do one of those things possibly if it escalates to a certain point. Because I think, like, if the tantrum escalates to a point beyond like being able to have a conversation with them, which is possible because like they are children, they haven't fully developed their linguistic and argumentative skills yet, then that would be an option. I'm not saying that would be my first choice, but it would cross my mind. Okay, so may maybe, and depending on your race. And, and you know, it's interesting you bring that up because there definitely is a cultural divide between the ideas of, of corporal punishment. Um, like w w whenever I've introduced this idea to my classes, I always see a pattern of like, mostly the white kids think it's like this terrible abuse to uh like hit your kid when like many students of color are like oh yeah that's totally normal like <laughs> yeah when i was growing up because well, i think that it isn't done to an extreme extent where like you would consider it child abuse like it's like eh, here there and then but then also because i noticed this with, like a lot of my latino friends is like our parents will disguise it as something else like they'll be like no we're doing this because we love you they're they're love slaps like don't <laughs> Don't take it the wrong way. <laughs> oh, my, my, my mom never bullshitted me like that. She was like, yeah, if you don't act up, you're going to get the chancla. Uh, mm -hmm. Those of you who don't know that it's like the sample. Yeah. And so like there is like obviously there, I agree that there can be issues that arise from that. Like I'm not blind to it, but I just think that there is like a certain point where a child's behavior cannot be handled by conversation or language. Maybe, maybe when they're at a certain age. Um, right, but you wouldn't want, like, as a parent, you would never want to get to that point where you cannot handle your child because that's a bad sign. Okay, I mean, again, that's fair. If, if it gets to that point, that might be a bad, um, a bad sign, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Aaron, I'm sorry, uh, you, have, you have your hand up. Um, I have a question for Serna then. At what age is it okay to start hitting your child? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> Good question. I think, okay, I don't want to say this and, like, sound like a bad person, but I think, like, five is that bad. I I think I'm bad. <laughs> but, okay, I don't know, because also I think it depends on size. Like, Latino kids are just built different. And, they, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know if that's because of cultural divide or, like, the way that they uh, parents choose to discipline their kids. But, like, I think that, it also depends on their circumstances. Like again, if if you don't have a problem with a child to that extent where you need to like discipline them physically, I wouldn't at any age. But if it does come to that point, I think the earliest age would be like five, six. Like I would never hurt a toddler. Are, are five okay, because for me toddler? that's past temper tantrum age. I don't know. There are some kids like they they be acting different. Like in the super like I was at the supermarket the other day and there was this ten year old. And first of all, I was like, why are you taking a ten year old out during quarantine? But also, like she was tall and she was having a full on tantrum. So I th yeah, I know it was like I felt embarrassed for the lady. But it's just I think that if it's not necessary, then it shouldn't be. But I think that five would be a good age. I would not hit a toddler in any way. Yeah, that's just my personal opinion, though. I don't know about my mom and my aunts. They, they got different <laughs> opinions on that. <laughs> yeah, that's my question. Thanks. Anyway, no, yeah. Uh, and for the record, I do not advocate uh, physically uh, uh, disciplining your children. Uh, I, I do think it's a bad idea. I'm just reflecting on the way I was raised. And I mean, I, I mean looking back on it now, it's funny. As a kid, it's terrifying. But... <laughs> And I think, you know, Aaron, you asked a good question. If you physically discipline your child, um, at what age do you start? And another question, at what age do you stop? Because at one point, like, it just, can you imagine if your parents, like, like took you out, like, spanked you now? That'd be weird. And, and I'm sure many of you are bigger than your parents now. Um, oh, let's see. Hold on. I see a few hands, but it doesn't say who. Uh, um, Alejandra. Um. Yeah, I, I completely disagree. I don't think you should ever hit your child. Like, there, even if it's, like, a little slap, there's just no evidence to support that hitting your child works. And, like, I was watching this thing with um, psychopathic children. Like, um, people, it's, like, it was, like, a thing explaining, like, how they, um, parents deal with that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard 
for the parents because they don't um, understand why like their child is like killing animals for no reason or like doing random shit. And like even in those situations, hitting your child is like n- like not the answer. Like I bet those parents probably want to hit their kid. Like the mom was literally like, "I hate this. I hate my child." But um, you like even in those situations, it doesn't work. They use like therapy and like um, just normal conversation to try and help the child through that. So yeah, I don't think there's ever a case where you have to hit your kid. Okay, again, and totally fair. And, and I suspect, I think, I think there's this, this this bias towards a more modern society of like, oh, it's it's un, it's unnecessary to hit your kid to discipline them. There's there's other modes to discipline. Okay, so just kind of get off this uh, topic for now. Okay, we all. It seems that most of us agree that physically disciplining your child is is maybe not the best idea, but that's because better forms of discipline exist. I don't think anyone here would say, oh, you shouldn't discipline your child at all. I think we all agree it's a terrible idea. Um, if a child's not disciplined at all, I mean, what, what, how are they going to grow up to be? Like, what kind of an adult? On Dr. Phil. <laughs> What's that? They end up on Dr. Phil. Yeah, they end up on Dr. Phil or in the White House. Um, and so, you oh, know, that's a good one. Uh, really? Oh, God. Have you guys read about Donald Trump's childhood? Tell if, if you haven't, I would highly recommend it. It really explains a lot. His, um, his dad, uh, what, what, what's his dad's name? Um, Fred. Uh, uh, Fred Trump was a dominating abuser um, who always kept, like, you know, Trump's mom under, under his thumb and the whole family under his thumb and would, like, uh, publicly, like, slap and humiliate Donald, uh, you know, like, in public, you know, uh, when, when, when he was growing up. And uh, it's like, oh, shit, that explains a lot. I mean, not to excuse his behavior, but it explains a lot. <laughs> Uh, oh, Aaron, you still have a hand up? That was accident, sorry. Oh, okay, you're good, you're good. Okay, but I guess the point that I wanted to reach here is this. You have to learn how to discipline a child if you want to be a successful parent. In much the same way, an institution has to learn how to discipline its members if it wants to continue to exist as an institution. The problem, says Foucault, is that many of these institutions have gotten, um, in a way, too good at disciplining people. And I'm going to show you why. Okay. Moving on. I, I know that, that, was, that was a long one, but thought experiments are good. Okay, we're gonna go over this concept today called docile bodies. Essentially, what I'm giving you is Foucault's playbook on how to discipline a human being. So you could apply this theoretically to parenting. Um, I actually apply this to teaching, <laughs> if you wanna know the truth. Uh, and it, it seems to be pretty effective. So there's three steps. The first step that we're gonna go over today is called creating a docile body. In other words, you cannot control or discipline a human being unless you control their physical body first. In other words, you can't discipline that child in the supermarket until you first have control over their body. Because for instance, you can't reason with them until you get them to sit down and be calm. Uh, You can't do anything or discipline to them unless their body is first under control. So let's talk about that. Docile bodies. Foucault points out that uh, for that forms of discipline that used to be common only in places like monasteries, armies, and workshops were becoming increasingly normal in all aspects of modern life. Okay, the discipline that we find in prisons was not normal. That existed, it did exist in societies before, like in the West especially, but that was restricted to things like monasteries, right? Where like monks had like really precise like prayer schedules. Or, you know, obviously militaries, you know, armies are, you know, a huge requirement is to maintain discipline. Uh, or workshops, you know, like pre-factory um, uh, places of work. Uh, th- these, this kind of discipline was essential for productivity. But now they're getting these models of production and discipline and applying them to everything, including families, including schools, et cetera, et cetera. And many of them are based off of designs for prisons. Okay, so docile bodies. Your body is not your own. Think about it. You're often told where to stand, where you can go, uh, where you can't go, when to sit, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you guys can especially see this now during a quarantine. <laughs> but even, even during a normal school day, think about it. You're told exactly where to go. Like your body, in a sense, is not your own. You're told like, okay, by this time of day, when the, when the clock strikes, you know, eight o'clock, you got to be in your seat in your period one class, in your assigned period one class. Then when the bell rings, you have to go to your period two. 
the bell rings, you go to your designated place of like, you know, you know, relaxation or socialization. And then uh, 20 minutes later, you go to your period three, et cetera, et cetera. Um, more than that though, there are tiny details in your everyday routine that do not treat you like a human being, says Foucault. They treat you and your body as nothing more than a machine, a cog in a very complicated machine. And Foucault says, this is what modern institutions have devolved into. So again, you are being disciplined by the institutions that you find yourself in. And the one that obviously you and I are engaged in is school. And in order to discipline you, you are not treated like an individual human being with free will and critical thought. You are treated like a cog in a machine. You're treated like, uh, like a machine. And if you are defective in some way, you must be corrected. That'll be um, next Monday's lecture. But okay, what do I mean by a machine? Let me explain. So, okay. Machines are always built with a specific purpose in mind. We do not think of machines as having free will. We do not think of machines as making like choices. We don't think of machines as like thinking um, entities. We think of machines like, okay, a coffee machine is supposed to do what? Make coffee. A printer is supposed to print paper, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And if a machine does not do it, the job that it was supposed to do well, then it needs to be either corrected or thrown out. Okay, now I gotta ask, in what ways does school turn you into a machine? Like what kind of a machine do schools try to turn you into? I'll repeat my question. If Foucault is right and social institutions like school are trying to turn you into a machine, what kind of machine does public school try to turn you into? Aaron? As dumb as this might sound, almost like a machine of like intellect they want you to or a machine that it it's like a cog in the machine that is like society as a whole like you have to become a productive member you have to learn the tools that'll help you get a job and then when you get a job you'll produce all these goods and services that you'll exchange for other goods and services and then keep capitalism running that's precisely it for those of you who are a little bit more aware of like social theory and social philosophy, um, it, it's almost a Marxist approach where it, 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 if Foucault takes an economic lens, he says that the schools that you're in are preparing you to enter into a capitalist workforce. And you're learning the skills and the training necessary for that, such as you have to wake up at some bullshit hour to go to work. You have to be a certain amount of productivity. You have to learn to get along with people you don't necessarily like, you know, in the purpose of working, et cetera, et cetera. And so school, in a sense, is turning you into a machine. Um, because look, it's not like, uh, do you, have you guys ever stopped and thought about the irony of trying to teach someone critical thinking? Like when a school says, oh, you know, we want to turn you into critical thinkers. Have you thought about the irony inherent in that, Serena? Yeah, it like comes to my mind a lot of times because also even within core, like, you know that teachers want you to say a certain thing, even if you disagree. And so you're just like, you know what? I'm just going to write it the way that they want it so I get my A. But, and, like, they'll tell you, like, oh, yeah, now I know that you're a critical thinker. And it's like, I'm not really a critical thinker. I just know what you want to hear. No, really. If you were really a critical thinker, then that means that you would be critical of everything that you're taught. And that would mean like questioning the things that I teach you, questioning the things that you learned in 11th grade, questioning the things you learned in 10th grade, et cetera, et cetera. And that's actually not encouraged. Can you imagine if someone were to write an IUE where they question the whole like legitimacy of the prompt or, or, or they write a completely different answer than what's expected? They'd probably get a bad grade. I mean, I, I wouldn't do that, but, um, but that happens so rarely. Uh, where someone like really actively takes like a stand against an assigned prompt. Like the thing about it, like, you know, we, we assign you a prompt and we're like, oh, we want you to think about it critically, but, 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 but low key, like, right, here's, here's an outline. You ever thought that's weird? And like when we engage in debates, do we actually engage in debates or are we, or is that just a tool to get us to all kind of think the same? Aaron? Just very much, no. There's there's certain ways that I remember it being where it's like we have a debate, but it's very like the I can't get over the fact we had debates over like should Cortez be treated as a hero? And that oh, yeah. was like our big debate. And it's 
first off, there's very much an answer they want to hear. And second off, it's very one-sided. Like that debate, the one where it's like, is Merceau a good person? There's very much like a perspective, both that you usually have and also that like they want you to have. And it's, there's not a lot of nuance in the debates that you give us, to be honest. Like I would like one where there was more ambiguity. Yes, uh, it's because those are hard. And, and when you make it like that, it, it opens up the whole curriculum to scrutiny and uh, criticism, which people don't actually want. Um, and by the way, just to defend CORE, just so I, you don't think I'm like totally just talking smack, I, I think CORE does a better job than many other programs does um, in this regard, but ultimately we're still stuck in this um, hypocritical sort of ironic paradigm of trying to teach someone critical thinking but, 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 not, but not too much, not too much. We're still trying to turn you into a, you know, a, a sort of machine. And so the irony is by turning someone into a critical thinking machine, they're not actually critical think, critically thinking. Uh, Jared? No, I agree with Aaron entirely. Um, and I do agree, I think Core does do a better job, but it's like, you hear the buzzwords like pre-professional, but that pretty much is the antithesis of critical thinking. Right, pre-professionals inherently saying, no, we just are training you to be like a good worker. Yeah. Um, but like people want both, right? People want someone who's heady, but practical. And uh, yes, I mean, this, so that, that's like a paradox, I think that you can't ever right. have. Yeah. No, and, and, but all right, but here's the thing. If we were to actually try and train you to be like actually critical thinkers, it might actually be counterproductive for you because then you're, you're going to be like a modern day Socrates where you're questioning everything and everyone surprise. That's going to make you very unlikable and unpopular among many people. And you're going to have a hell of a time getting into colleges or getting a job. <laughs> that's kind of the, the inherent irony you have to conform. Uh, and so we have to try and, and train you and make you conform in order to be successful. And so, and, but then, you know, when you start shrouding and like, you know, Oh, we're such like critical thinkers. Like, are, are you really, like when you think about your political views, your religious views, your philosophical views, um, God, I cannot tell you how many times, like in the past like three years that I taught philosophy, I teach X philosopher and so many students are like, oh my God, I totally agree with X. And then, you know, I'll go, oh, here's a philosopher who totally disagrees with that asshole. Oh, I totally agree with Y now. And it's like, oh my God, like, you know, like my, my, my goal as a philosophy teacher is just to expose you to different points of view. Like it really does not personally offend me if you disagree with me. In fact, I would prefer that you disagree with me than just blindly like, yep, oh, why does I agree? Like I appreciate far more a student that has the guts to argue against Wittgenstein than someone who just like praises him. Because there's actually like, for instance, like Wittgenstein, you guys know, like I'm totally like on team Wittgenstein, but I recognize that there's a lot of problems in his philosophy and there's a lot of things that, that are left unanswered. Um, and so it's interesting to engage in those, in those arguments. But uh, I, as a philosophy teacher, maybe, maybe my subject is different, but like if I were a math teacher, I don't want kids like arguing with me about like, but Butler, what's the nature of two? Like, you know, that's annoying. Uh, <laughs> so it might be something just inherent to my field. I don't know. Um, I'll tell you what, let, 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 let's, let, let's move on. I have more examples. Okay. Let's take, uh, okay, so let's, let's stop talking about school for a second. Let's talk about soldiers. Because um, Foucault would talk about the military as a really good example. Okay, Foucault pointed out, in the past, the way a soldier was viewed was a, you know, usually a man, was kind of born to be a soldier. Like, you know, great warriors like Ajax and Achilles, or, you know, um, people of renown in the military. You were kind of built to be a soldier. Like, some men were, were made to be soldiers and some just weren't either because of some inherent physical or, or, or um, psychological qualities. You know, um, you're just bigger and stronger than your peers, or you're more brave, or you have better leadership, or whatever. So the point of view used to be that soldiers were born. You know, you were kind of born to be a soldier, and that's the profession that you should enter into. We have a different view now. How do we view soldiers now? That they're born? Adam? Oh, we now see that soldiers are made, not born. Correct. We now see soldiers as a entity, a machine that is not born, but rather one that is made. I mean, the Marine Corps, like, you know, they advertise themselves like, doesn't matter who you are, we can turn you into a Marine. And you know what? I believe them. Uh, if you get, you know, inducted into their, um, 
their recruitment, you know, their, their boot camp, yes, they're going to physically and psychologically train you to be a Marine. And uh, they can take like 99.9% .9 of the population and uh, yeah, turn them into a Marine. Um, and especially, especially if it's, if it's a volunteer, um, you know, a conscription. So there's this idea that uh, the military will discipline you and turn you into a machine. So it doesn't matter like who you are, it doesn't matter if you don't like violence, it doesn't matter whatever, they will train you, they will turn you into a machine. One of the best illustrations of this in a film that I've ever seen is, uh, has anyone seen Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket? That is so good. It's a great movie. Uh, yeah. Stanley, great movie. Stanley Kubrick's the same guy who directed uh, The Shining, by the way, for those of you who uh, remember that. Uh, so tell you what, I'd like to, again, I don't want to get flagged on YouTube, so I'm, what I'm going to do is this. Uh, oh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. The bathroom. I'm going to put a link on the uh, chat to a scene near the beginning of the film, which is, uh, introduces uh, Gunnery Sergeant Hartman. Um, so Full Metal Jacket is a, war, is a movie about the Vietnam War. And the first half of the movie is mainly about like boot camp and, and these Marines getting trained for the Vietnam War. And the second half is them in Vietnam. So this is when they're getting introduced to their drill sergeant. Uh, it's a very iconic scene. Warning, there is a lot of graphic cursing, uh, very colorful language, very, very colorful language. Uh, so warning if you uh, have sensitive ears. Um, so I'd like you to just watch the clip. We'll reconvene in five minutes. Oh, and just a fun fact, uh, the guy, the, the actor they, they hired for, to play the drill sergeant was actually a drill sergeant in the Marines. So a lot of this was like Stanley Kubrick just told him like, all right, man, we're just going to roll the camera. Just, you know, do, do your thing. And uh, this is his thing. So I have put a link in the chat. Uh, take five minutes and then we'll reconvene. Is this the bathroom scene? Can we do that one? No, no, no. This is the one he's introducing himself. <laughs> all right, five minutes, five minutes. We'll reconvene.
<clears throat> All right. Seems like people are finishing. <laughs> what did you guys think of that? <laughs> that was something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like I said, he really was a drill sergeant. So Kubrick just like was like, "All right, I'm just gonna roll the camera. Just do what you would normally do." <laughs> Yikes. Okay. So uh, is there, if everyone's ready, I'm gonna go ahead and get back to the PowerPoint. We're almost done, by the way, for today. But I do want to finish with one important point. Everyone good? Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Sound off like you got a pair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, he ends up getting killed, by the way. Uh, spoiler. Okay. No. Now. <laughs> okay. So, Full Metal Jacket. Great movie. Uh, if you have an opportunity to watch it during the this quarantine, uh, go for it. Okay. How does that movie clip illustrate Foucault's point about docile bodies? What seems to be the sergeant's first objective in instilling discipline to these men? When you stop and think about it, what, what, what seems to be the first step he takes? Serna. Instilling fear. So instilling fear, yes. But when you really stop and think about it, what does he have to control? And you're right, what does he have to control first? Uh, Serna? Um, to make sure that they're listening to him. So yeah, they do have to, con he does have to control their bodies because he has to make sure that they can all line up and stay quiet so they can listen to what he has to say. Precisely. The first thing he has to do is control their bodies. Uh, Adam, do you want to add on to that or was that what you're going to say? Yeah, I was going to say more of the same. Okay. Yeah. And it makes sense. Like, okay, he can't discipline them. Like he can't train them properly unless he has their absolute, like total obedience. And if they're rebellious in some way, like, you know, physically, like, you know, uh, uh, the uh, Joker, private Joker, you know, he, he cracks some dumb joke and he like, you know, totally goes off on him. Why does he do that? Like, it's just a dumb joke. Like, well, like well, why does the drill sergeant take it so almost personally? Serna? To set an example for the other soldiers. Yep, that's right. In fact, I remember uh, when I was uh, student teaching, my, uh, so I, I did my student teaching at San Fernando High. I remember my, uh, my master teacher uh, told me, she, she, she was really weird, I, I, I liked her a lot. It was actually her last year of teaching. Um, she was gonna retire. And she told me that uh, if, if you ever have a really unruly class, um, what you need to do is you need to like pick one kid, probably like the kid that's like really acting out the most, and you use them as an example. Like you fucking crucify that child. And then that serves as a warning for the rest of the kids to not fuck with you. <laughs> I really appreciated that uh, blunt advice, because um, in a sense, she, uh, you know, she was right, and I think it is right. Um, you control people's bodies, and mostly through fear, uh, and then, you know, look, in much the same way, like in a much, much less extreme way than in the military, your bodies are controlled in school. I mean, you're told, okay, please sit down, uh, you know, go here, go over here, do this, don't do that, et cetera, et cetera. Ask for permission to use the bathroom, you know, crap like that. Aaron? Okay, but that's literally what Mr. Butler does every single year at the beginning of the year is he chooses a kid and he just shits on the kid for doing something, even if it's nothing. Uh, yes, and why do you think Butler does it? He doesn't do it on accident. To scare the crap out of us. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I think I told you guys, but I had Butler for calc too, so I, I, I know what Daryl's like. Uh, <laughs> Adam? Have you ever had to do that in your time here? Uh, at core? No. No. Yeah, yeah, core kids are usually pretty easy to scare. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've actually, you know, I reflect back. I've actually been lucky enough to very, very rarely have behavior issues with kids, like super rare. Um, and usually it's just like one stern talking to and they're fine. Uh, I find generally speaking, when you treat kids well, they treat you well. Crazy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so there's this whole idea of docile bodies uh, where your body has to be controlled first. And now I want you to think about the ways in which your body is made docile. Um, we're gonna skip the reading just for now. There's just one little uh, thing that I will uh, share with you. You, you. you don't have to turn to this because it's really, really short I mean, unless you want to. But on page 19, there's this um, uh, uh, little passage where a new school is invented around the, uh, the end of the 17th century that follows a model closely resembling that of prisons. Um, it's the first of its kind and it's very successful where what they do basically is they create a whole hierarchical system of school where they actually create grade levels. 
grade levels according to age were actually an invention. Did you know that before uh, classes were based on uh, achievement or, or, or wealth or patronage? They weren't based on age. So for instance, like, um, you know, instead of getting like, you, you wouldn't be considered like a 12th grader, you know, you're in philosophy class and, you know, maybe it's filled with certain, you know, with certain age group, like 12th, like what would be 12th graders, but it depends on a kid's grades, achievements, et cetera, et cetera. Putting kids into uh, grades based on age group is actually a relatively modern invention because it keeps, keeps people in line. And then you guys are then like older students are thought to be more responsible and are given more responsibilities and duties than younger kids. Um, for those of you who TA, that's probably true. For those of you who are in uh, Dilsey's support class, the that fifth period, that's another example. Um, how older students are expected to then take care of the younger students. And in an ideal institution of learning, those older students, when they graduate, will one day return and become the teachers. <laughs> Does that sound a little bit like a certain program? Core bubble. Yeah, it's scary. Like more and more, I think. Apparently, we're hiring a new teacher next year, and she's also a former student. Does it feel kind of culty to you ever? Because it always feels kind of culty to me the way that. Yes, happens. it's super culty. It actually, it's it actually makes me very uncomfortable. Core is super incestual. Uh, fully half of our teachers are former students. That I don't know any other program that 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 has that. Uh, it's it weird. Helps. It helps keep the mindset of like like that thing you said with bless me Ultima. It's like if every single teacher was taught that, that creates that connection to it, and it makes people more afraid to like question the program, even if they're newer people to it. Yes. So like we have this old material that's from like the seventies that we still teach, but it's like because the kids were taught it, and then they were taught it, and then there was I core is irritating to me in some ways. I uh, don't want to talk about this on camera, but we can talk about it later. Uh. <laughs> Uh, but yes, to answer your question, it is kind of weird. Um, I mean, again, I think about how many of, our, of, your, of your teachers are former students. I mean, obviously me, um, uh, Dr. Williams, Mr. Saavedra, uh, Del Pino, um, uh, Silva, Edmund, um, Kim, uh, Peroff, uh, I'm missing someone. A lot, a lot, like half, e uh, easily half. Anyway, so th that's kind of the point I wanted to make where schools are now becoming this weird hierarchical prison-like design. And the purpose is again to turn you into a machine. You are molded, shaped, programmed by your modern institutions to behave in a very particular way to achieve very specific goals. And these institutions have gotten very good at it. Question. Do you think core is trying to turn you into a machine? And if so, what kind of machine are we trying to turn you into? Again, I'll repeat myself, two questions. Do you think the school that you've been in, core, is attempting to turn you into a machine? And if so, what kind of machine? Jared. Um, I, I mean, I think so to some degree, as you were saying, otherwise it's just like roam free. And I mean, I guess teaching stuff like Hume would kind of counter that position because it's so absurd in certain ways that like it does make you question this stuff. Um, no, but I would say like the goal of course to give you like a practical yet theory based education to do something good in the world. I think that's, or that's at least what Macon says on the tours. I don't know if that's like you know holistically true but i think that's the general focus well maybe she's right um i've never taken that grandiose view i i don't think we're creating a, a class of, uh, of of world saviors what i think we're doing more practically is we're creating college-bound students um it, it's a little bit different now because uh college acceptances are so much more difficult now for you guys than they were for my generation but like uh 10 years ago when i was a senior it was like it was an unquestionable just fact of life that you were going to a four-year university. Like whenever you talk to any of your peers, like it didn't matter if you're going to a state school or if you're going to a private or you're going, you know, abroad or whatever, it didn't matter. Uh, but it was like unquestioned. Like it was just like, oh yeah, it wasn't like, are you going to college? It was what college are you going to? And back, uh, and again, back in my day, God, that makes me old. Back in my day, um, less and less people went to CC from core because there was more of a stigma uh, surrounding it. And, and I think there still is to an extent, 
but more and more of you are going to CC for very practical reasons. I mean, mostly financial. Um, that I think that's starting to change. But, but at least the culture when I was in core, it was very much like you have to go to college. You have to go to college. Like, like it, 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 you never even like considered not going to college. And I and, and and I'm sure that culture is still a little bit there. But guys, that doesn't exist everywhere. That does not exist everywhere. You go to a much poorer neighborhood. Um, you know, you, you don't have to go that far. In, in the regular school at Cleveland, do you think the culture uh, among a lot of kids in like uh, the the residential program is? Oh yeah, you're 100 percent are going to college. No. Uh, you, it's, it's a given in core, but it's not a given everywhere. Uh, Adam? I think the stigma against CC has sort of disappeared because there's still the expectation that after you're done with CC, you'll still go to a public or, or, or a four-year college. Right, right, right. So, yeah, the idea is like, oh, it's just a stepping stone to go to a four-year college. Right. Right. So, so, so the expectation is still there. Yeah. Uh, Serna? Yeah, my younger sister, she's in the uh, arts and technology program. And she like talks about how she thinks that core kids are hypnotized into thinking that college is the greatest thing ever. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. she's like, cause uh, especially about community colleges, she's like, everyone goes to community. Like it's not a problem. Yeah. Or trade school also, which I didn't even consider. And I don't think most kids, core kids considered to go to trade no. school. But she was like, yeah, like this kid wants to be a barber. So he's just going to go to trade school, become a barber, like good yeah. for him. That's what he wants to do. And so it's like, well, that's kind of weird. No, really. I mean, uh, you guys are trained to be college bound machines. And listen, that is not an accident. This program by design was created to be, this magnet is an integrationist magnet. Do you guys know way back in the day when this magnet was first started, um, the overwhelming populations were, uh, it was mostly white kids. So Reseda was really white back then. It was mostly white kids and black kids that were bussed in from urban areas. That's mostly what it was. It was actually mostly black and white. Uh, Ethan? So for for the SLP uh, in 11th grade, at the place I, we did it, like in my group, there was actually one of the volunteers there was like an older black lady and she was in core, or not in core, but she was in a magnet in the 60s, she was saying, and she was in like one of the first classes and she lived in South Central and her parents got like a tiny tax rebate, like someone knocked on the door and was like, yo, here's this tiny little tax credit if you ship your kid across the across the city to the valley. And they were like, oh, okay, cool, free money. And they did it. And she, that's how they got a lot of people to start doing the magnets. Yes, because the idea behind it is if you get people of color, minorities, and you mix them in with people who are more privileged, it's kind of like, kind of like in a sense, dissipate the wealth. And I can tell you from a personal experience, that's true. Um, so I was raised very poor and very brown. And, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up here in, uh, in Silmar. And uh, I remember busing to Cleveland uh, and, you know, I, I, I didn't know anything. My parents didn't know anything about like the educational system. They're like, oh, sounds like a good school. Cool. Sick. Let's ship her or kid over there. And I, I tell you this in all seriousness, kids, I interacted with my first Jewish person in core. I'd never met a Jew before that. I was surrounded by brown people, by Mexicans, uh, both in my neighborhood and in my schools. I, I, it was the first time I ever interacted with, uh, with a Jew, with a Korean. Uh, uh, with someone who was openly gay. It was a huge culture shock, especially when I was in ninth grade. Uh, it was a huge culture shock for me. And, you know, to be around these kids that uh, were like, you know, college was a given, uh, it was also weird to me. I'm like, oh, that's, that's unique. That's weird. Uh, kids, I, did, I learned that the SAT was racist before I learned what the SAT actually was <laughs> in 11th grade. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, Jared, yes, it was Ian. Now, <laughs> uh, 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 Ethan, you still have your hand up? Was, was, was that a comment? Or... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm fine. Okay, uh, Serena. Oh, something similar happened because when my dad got a new job, we moved. And so first I went to a Spanish-speaking school and it was all Latino kids, like, obviously. And then I moved to Superior Street and it was so weird for me because, like, even in elementary school, they were talking about college. And it was such a new idea for me. And I was like, this is like, why are y'all stressing about this now? Like I was in my Flocorico class chilling and this is what you guys do for after school activities. Yeah. But, um, and then something similar happened to my brother because at that point he was uh, going into high school and he didn't take the SAT because he didn't know what it was. Yeah. Like he just didn't take it. And 
my parents like and then afterwards they found out and my parents and my sister then they were like you have to find out what an SAT is and you have to take it because that's what they said at the parent meeting. So go, yeah, yeah. go find an SAT. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, precisely, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, so that's kind of the point I want to make when, when you reflect on core. I think core really does try to turn you into a machine, a college-bound machine. I mean, philosophy, I love philosophy, of course. And I think you can make it useful if you really make it your own, like if you, you know, synthesize those ideas for yourself. Um, but in and of itself, it, the only like real practical skill I give you is that it'll make you feel really smart when you go to college. <laughs> That's it, really. Like when you take humanities classes, especially when you want to be like a lawyer, like you want to get into law, philosophy is really useful. Um, but other than that, I mean, you know, <laughs> kind of the same thing. Okay. So the whole idea, in conclusion, is to create a docile body. That's the first step when it comes to disciplining people. And I want you to realize the ways in which your institutions do that to you. I'm focusing a lot on school because that's the one that obviously we're a part of, but in everything, in everything, like you, first of all, you have to physically control that person. Uh, we're gonna go into that, into much more detail with that later, like the ways in which you make a person docile, but I want you to realize that that's the main goal of an institution to turn you into a docile body, to make you passive, so then they can discipline you. And we're gonna go, again, we're gonna go over the techniques um, on, uh, on Monday next week. Okay, so quick review of what we did today. We uh, reviewed the discussion, oops, discussion board number one, sorry about that, discussion board number one. Uh, we did the thought experiment, spoiled brat, which is this, today's discussion board. Uh, we went, discussed the concept of docile bodies. We went over this idea that you are a machine, and we're going to be going over the techniques of discipline. The first one was, of course, today with docile bodies. On Monday will be the means of correct training. And next Wednesday will be the Panopticon. Okay, folks, thank you so much for uh, tuning in and participating. Uh, there will be much more to discuss with Foucault later on. This is just an introduction. We'll go over the other parts of it later. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to start recording. Thank you guys very much. I'm going to stick around for a couple minutes and wait for my period two to trickle in. If you have any questions or you'd like to stick around for a little bit, you're more than welcome to. Otherwise, please go ahead and answer the discussion board by the end of today. I will see you later. Have a wonderful day. Bye.